What inspires Governor General Award winner Kevin Major? <laughs> On this week's episode of All About Books, we're going to find out. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome. If you are a book lover, please stop right there and hit that subscribe button on the end of your screen because every week I interview a new Canadian author and we get to find out the behind the scenes of the book. This week, I am so excited to have Kevin Major with me. Kevin is a uh, Governor General Award winner. He has published over 20 award-winning books and we'll be discussing his latest, Sebastian Zinnard, Two for the Tablelands. It was published by Breakwater Books. What the book is about is it's off season and Newfoundland tour guide Sebastian is hiking in Gross Moor National Park with his son, his teenage son, and they discover a half buried body of a murdered victim. This puts Sebastian on a dangerous landscape that leaves him face to face with the book. And it is a great read. I highly encourage you to read it. Thank you so much, Kevin, for coming on this week's episode of All About Books. I'm thrilled to have you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Now, Kevin, you have an incredible body of work. You've got young adult novels, historical fiction, nonfiction, poetry, plays, and of late you ventured into crime novels. So mm -hmm. why did you decide to write murder mysteries? <laughs> well, I, I guess there are a couple of reasons. One of the major ones is the encouragement of my wife, uh, Anne. Uh, I had just been working for almost a decade, I guess, on three major historical novels that are fairly serious and required a lot of research. So, you know, it was pretty intense. And she said, Kevin, you have a great sense of humor. Uh, you're not showing it of late. Um, why don't you think about incorporating that in some way into the next book you write? So I had been reading a few murder mysteries. She was a bit of a murder mystery crime novel fan herself. And I thought, well, maybe I can write a, a, a crime novel with a bit of a sense of humor. And as you know, from reading the book, Sebastian is a bit of an offbeat character. Uh, there are times I hope you chuckled, um, but beneath it, there is, there, is a, there is a murder and a murder that needs to be solved. So I, I said, well, I'm gonna give this a try. If, if it works out, fine. If it doesn't, well, at least I know it's another area I've entered into. So as it happened, the first one, which was called One for the Rock, um, my, my, my first uh, book of, of crime fiction, uh, met with a pretty good response. So people seemed to enjoy it. Uh, they encouraged me to continue on. Are we going to hear another story about Sebastian and his adventure? So this is where I am at the moment. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, um... What I'm, what I'm also doing, um, Kevin, is through social media, I posed a question out to book lovers and I said, if you are having an author over for dinner, mm -hmm. what would you ask them? So I have a question from a book lover, Michael Black, that I'd like to ask you. Okay. Michael would like to know, he says that different people's approach to the craft of writing they approach it from different angles, mm -hmm. according to their varied perspectives and how they think. So Michael is always interested to know whether the individual author starts with the grain of an idea that they want to flesh out, or if a character comes marching in their heads, mm -hmm. or was it a scene that came fully formed? So for you, Kevin, um, how did how did how did you approach your writing? Well, it, it really depends on the book. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I've written books in which I pretty well knew the whole story, kind of beginning to end, not in tremendous detail, but I had a feeling where it was going, where it would end up. Yes. With this book, I really didn't know. I and maybe Sebastian came. I think Sebastian came to me first. It was this character okay. and creating this voice. 
and we, you know, he introduces himself uh, yeah. in the very first book. He said, my name is Sebastian Sinner. So it, uh, it carried on from there. So with, with both of these, these crime novels, I, I start with a situation. I have a kind of a general idea what the opening will be. And, you know, mm -hmm. in this case, a body is discovered. But exactly what will happen subsequently or how we find out um, you know, how, how we find out who the, the, the murderer is, mm -hmm. um, I don't really know. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked my work way through, you know, and so the victim in this case turned out to be a, a graduate student and yes. Mexican. Okay. All right. So this creates possibilities. Um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I spent a month in, with my wife and I spent a month in San Miguel de Andy in, in okay. Mexico. Uh, in fact, this is, that's where this tapestry beyond, behind me came from. Um, and I thought, well, you know, if this is on Mexico, maybe there's a way that <laughs> <laughs> he could end up there for, for a time. And, you know, I can take advantage of things that I remember about uh, the, the place that I visited. And, you know, what will happen from then? You know, there's, there's a bit of an insight into an academic community with their yes. odd sort of characters uh, coming there. So that sort of one thing leads to another. And then, of course, we have um, the standard characters of not only Sebastian, but his son, Nick, mm -hmm. uh, who's, you know, in both books, the dog, Gaffer, which is yes. a character yeah, and his ex-wife and his ex-wife's partner now, who also turns out uh, to be a police inspector. So, you know, these, these set characters, then my idea is that through the course of both books and maybe subsequent books, uh, the characters are going to change. They're going to evolve. Uh, Nick mm -hmm. is going to get older. His concerns are going to get different. Uh, maybe the relationship with the ex-wife will uh, calm down somewhat. Uh, maybe he'll meet somebody in Sebastian that is meet somebody himself. So we'll see where it goes. <laughs> I love that. And you know, Kevin, one of my favorite things in your novel is the um, great relationship between father and son. Mm -hmm. Because Sebastian and his newly teenage son, Nicholas, um, there's a really great dynamic between them. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about this relationship? Well, it's one of my kind of favorite parts of the book, this dynamic between them. And, you know, mm -hmm. they play against each other. Um, they have some issues, but beneath it all, there's a very firm love between them. And situations create tension, but they seem to work, work, work itself through. Um, I have two sons myself, and they're, you know, now grown up with, families of their own. Yeah. Uh, so I remember pretty well what, what having a teenage son was like. Yes. Um, and also, I, for a time, I was a school teacher and I taught junior high. So, you know, you meet all kinds of <laughs> characters, so to speak. Uh, and my wife was a teacher as well. So, you know, all those things together. And, and, and having written uh, a number of so-called young adult novels, um, mm -hmm. Nick's character came fairly easily to me um so he's gonna he's gonna be it's gonna be interesting as he matures and, and the situation change what 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 will emerge i and i just when i was reading i just thought he is such an, a neat kid like i love that um that the father son cook together like i thought that was a really fantastic yeah. element of their relationship i really enjoyed that <laughs> Um, so you had mentioned that when you were writing, you didn't, um, you know, you kind of went with the flow. Was there any moment in your writing that you, where you were surprised with where your characters were taking you? Yeah, I think I, I, I would have to say yes. I'm, I'm, I probably can't sort of pinpoint, but you, you, you never really know, at least I didn't really know where the the characters would take me. Um, there were there was one, if I remember correctly, one point in the story where 
um, he went somewhere where I had to backtrack and rewrite and kind of head in a different direction because it was leading kind of to a dead end and you couldn't you couldn't have that there there right. needed to be more in, in the you know past that that element so um, in both these cases both books I remember sort of halfway through the story thinking I had to sit down and plot out to some extent what's going to mm -hmm. happen in the next half of the book yeah. because I'll end up not knowing exactly where I'm going. I'm going to waste time by, by writing uh, and then having to discard that and kind of start over. Uh, and an author doesn't really want to be wasting time, I guess. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then that, and I just, the book I'm working now, I, I probably did that about two weeks ago. I took three or four days and just kind of settled into what, what's going to happen that can lead to the solving of uh, the crime? What, you know, what's going to be the background? Who is going to meet who and what is that person going to know and so on? Now, um, as the, the crime mystery genre is new to you, um, what challenges did you have when you entered writing in this genre? Hmm. I didn't really know. Uh, what the response would be. I mean, crime fiction is such a big uh, element in, in publishing these yes. days, you know, and they're, they sell in vast numbers and not some of them, but there's a lot of people kind of middle road, I guess, who, who do okay, but you know, are not the Fred Vargas's of the world. <laughs> yes. um, but, uh, you know, I thought this, I also was thinking this is a, not kind of this ultra serious crime novel, uh, you know, and it's not particularly black, black and dark and gruesome. Uh, I mean, there is a body, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, and I'm not, I'm not out to, and I, and I kind of wasn't interested in knowing a great deal about uh, the working, for example, of the police department in, in all its details and perhaps what it's, what it's undertaking. It, it, it kind of fell in place. And if I had a question, I <laughs> phoned the local <laughs> police department yeah. on a couple of occasions and said things like, okay, this, in this case, um, this, this crime took place on the west coast of Newfoundland. Uh, um, I think the RCMP is going to be responsible because they, they police the, out, you know, the outlying regions of Newfoundland. Um, but the body's going to end up in St. John's and in St. John's, it's the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, which is mm -hmm. the provincial police department has jurisdiction. Um, but yet, um, the, the person that I, Frederick, I, who was Samantha's partner, works for the RNC, so I want him to be involved. So, is there a point at which the RCMP will, will liaison with the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary over a particular crime? So I, I phoned up inspector so-and-so <laughs> at the RCMP and posed this question. Uh, and he said, yeah, if they have expertise that we need, or, you know, if, or perhaps if we're overwhelmed by things that we have to do, and then they might be able to offer help in some way. Yeah, then we have a good relationship. So that's perfect for me. I thought, yeah, okay, we can bring in, we can bring in the two police forces. So, you know, that, that, uh, so it's kind of strange the way things unfold, but you know, that's, that, it seemed to me it to be successful, at least from my perspective. And now, you know, readers expected one thing and, you know, I, I think my book is not going to delight every uh, person who likes crime fiction. Maybe they're looking for, for other things. That's fine. You know, people have their choices in fiction. Well, I, I, I really liked it. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Definitely enjoyed it. Now, actually, could you give our listeners a little taste and uh, read a little excerpt for us? Okay. Sure, yeah, I can certainly do that. 
And if you could let us know um, before you read the excerpt, just why you've chosen to share this particular passage with us. Well, uh, uh, when I do readings, I tend to read from the beginning of the book mm -hmm. because you know, if you read from the middle towards the end, you're kind of giving away too much. Right. And, and it's a way of uh, allowing the reader to enter into the story mm -hmm. from kind of from my perspective. So in the end, if the person does purchase a book or get it from the library and starts that opening passage, maybe they hear my voice <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in the background. So uh, there's a little preface which I'm not going to read, but this is the beginning of, uh, of chapter one. So um, Sebastian and his son, Nicholas, uh, it's Thanksgiving weekend, they've traveled from St. John's to the west coast of Newfoundland to Grossmore National Park. And the, one of the first things they do is climb Grossmore, which is the, uh, the second highest peak in Newfoundland. I am increasingly freaked by heights which has a lot to do with the fact that last year I skidded, scraped, and plummeted down a near perpendicular drop of 30 meters and lived. Uh, I was never predisposed to heights, but now they do very weird things to my head and my intestines. I steer clear of ledges, of which there is no shortage in Newfoundland. Nicholas, my freshly teenage son, seems not to have inherited that gene, following the footsteps of his mother, so to speak. Samantha, when she was also my wife, was forever one to lead me to precipitous circumstances. <clears throat> I digress, which brings me to the reason I now find myself this Thanksgiving weekend, climbing Grossmorn, the second highest peak in Newfoundland. To be precise, it is not really a peak, more of a pink ball-headed nalgan that rises within the confines of Grossmore National Park, spectacular though it is in its own way. Nicholas is impressed. 13-year-olds, I know full well, are not easily impressed. Is their hormonal predisposition to be underwhelmed? Having once been a teacher, I know of what I speak, grade eight, from which Nick, Nick recently emerged, generally unscathed, as far as I can tell, uh, though the jury is still out, is universally thought of among teachers as, quote, the lost year. Puberty has kicked in and unsuspecting trainees turn, turn hopelessly oddball. A few months into grade nine and set adolescence are usually set to rejoin the human race. This is fun, says Nicholas, as we ascend the kilometer of scree consisting of hefty fragments of blasted quartzite left by receding glaciers. Fun is such an all-encompassing descriptor. I prefer interesting or more precisely, strenuously interesting. The 50-ish father cannot, however, let on that he might not be totally up for the task at hand. Sure is, I manage, between somewhat labored breaths. Fortunately, the sun, the veritable billy goat, is several steps ahead and not party to my panting. We have already hiked four kilometers through forest and flies to get to the base of the peak. The rock shroom ascent does have enough wind to keep the flies at bay, which is no mean boost to my overall well-being. Life will be grand. I am supremely confident once we get to the top. It's pushing an hour and a half, but just when you think you will go no higher, a new expanse of blasted quartzite reveals itself. On top of that, the wind goes from fly inhibiting to stiff and chilled. The temperature has dropped, rain threatens, and devilishly thick accumulations of low clouds, i.e. fog, Look about to join us for the last few meters to the top. We are finally at the proof of our climb, the substantial sign that reads, Gross Morn, Summit, 806 meters, Somme Gros The fact that it is the same elevation in both English and French 
is nothing if not a stimulant, stimulant for the tired mind. A little closer, if you would, I say to the overly fit senior, who has offered to take a picture of the mountain conquering duo with my iPhone. At that distance, the sign should be readable through fog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Kevin, I have to ask, did you do this hike yourself for research? I did that hike, and I'm very proud to say when I was 12 years old. Mm. Ah. So this area of Newfoundland is sort of my ancestral home. I didn't grow up there, but my parents did and lived there for a good part of their, their life. They moved and then I was born. Uh, but we always went back, of course, and it didn't have the stature of the tablelands. It's a very unique geological feature mm -hmm. uh, in the world, and it didn't really have the status at that time. It eventually became a national park, of course, uh, and I've climbed it at least twice since, so yeah, I do know it. Okay, yeah, because it, it really felt like when I was reading that opening chapter that, that you had, had done that before. <laughs> Oh, so what are you currently working on, Kevin? Another Sebastian uh, novel? <laughs> Maybe no surprise. Uh, mm -hmm. Crime novel number three. <laughs> okay, I won't tell you the title or really what it's about, except it starts with the word three. <laughs> three, four, <laughs> something, <laughs> someplace. Um, yeah, so yeah, I've, I've, I've sort of gotten into a, a routine with this, which I uh, very much like. I get up fairly early in the morning mm, and, and mm -hmm. write, and that's kind of my best time for writing. So I devote um, two hours initially, and that that's yeah. seems to be the most productive, and then sometime later in the day. So if I can complete a page a day, that that kind of, you know, after time it builds up into uh, to a manuscript. So. That's where I'm going at the moment. Thank you. Nice. And how far along are you? Uh, I'm over halfway of the first draft. So I'm, I'm giving myself till the end of March to, mm -hmm. to have a draft that, uh, that an editor will be willing to look at. Oh, so that's something we have to look forward to next year then. <laughs> I'm hoping next fall, but possibly the spring of the following year. We'll see how the publishing Schedule okay. okay. Well, best wishes with your writing and a great big thank you, Kevin, for coming on the show today. I so enjoyed talking to you and learning more about Sebastian. I will put links down below to your website so listeners can um, go to your website to learn more about you, but also to Breakwater's website so they can purchase a copy of, of your book, Two for the Table Lands. Thank you everyone for listening today and come back next Tuesday because I will have another 